Hey, this is Snowblitz. Six string. Starlight Ironhoof. Four strain. And Zeta Prime. And this is Elements of Harmony. Tonight on the show, we have with us a legend, a musician who has been around since the inception of Brony music, rumored to be the first Brony musician. Eurobeat Odyssey, otherwise known as Eurobeat Brony, is a master of the Eurobeat genre, having adapted nearly every song from the show into his signature style. He is a figurehead of the Brony music scene, and he joins us here tonight. Okay, wait, wait, hold on. I have to complain about that intro. What do you mean rumored to be the first? I mean, he's been writing pony music since Rescue at Midnight Castle in the 80s. Yeah, he was like the beginning, the pioneer. I wrote music before I was out of the uterus. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Forrest, how dare you mention Inception and not put a boi in the intro? There you go. All right. Now we can get on with it. Yeah. Oh, my God. Anyway. Eurobeat, Hello. Hello. Welcome. Oh, how are you doing this fine evening? Hey, it's been a long day, but it, but it has ended well so far. That's good. We feel ya. It looks like we finally reached the beginning, because isn't it true that you are credited with the first ever Brony song? Yeah. That's correct. Basically, I started working on a remix of Evil Enchantress in January 2012, and I believe that was out shortly, um, either, I forget, it's either late January or early February, whereas some of the later ones that came from, you know, Renard Queenston, like uh, Rainbow Dash Likes Girls or some of Jane Algorithm's material, I believe those came shortly thereafter. You mean 2011. 2011? Yeah. Wow, yeah. Yeah. Has it, really been, has it really been that long? I think so. I'm afraid so. I feel so old. Yes, it has. <laughs> Three years. <laughs> almost, almost yeah. four years. Almost four yeah. years. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I remember your first song coming out right around when I got in. Yeah. So, yeah, 2011. My mistake. Um, wow, even I don't know my own history. But yeah, that uh, about January 2011 was when that came out, late January, early February. Then came uh, some Renard stuff. It could be that they produced theirs first. I just released mine first. Beat them right to the punch. I just remember all the way back then, all the Brony music back then was basically just, you know, remixes of the show and ponies, you know, kind of like that, uh, the Wiki yeah. Wiki Pony that we played. Well, not necessarily. Uh, don't forget that uh, Not A Clever Pony was one of the very first musicians as well, and her material is uh, all original. Of course, it also doesn't have any lyrics, so going by modern standards, a lot of people would call it Pino, which I think is an incredibly stupid, dumb term that has no business being anywhere in the music business at all. Can you, can you explain what that term is? It's for elitist snobs who can't listen to things without there being pony in it. That's people who willingly deprive themselves of joy in their lives. Okay, sorry, I've had a bit of a rant about this, but <clears throat> let me try to do this more objectively. No, 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 that's fine. Do it. Do it completely unobjectively. There, there, are, people, there are people who will literally not listen to music, not look at art, not watch something on YouTube unless it is pony related. And they... Actually, the term that came out for some of these, you know, songs that were released on Equestria Daily, you know, it's a Pino, which is P-I-N-O, pony in name only. You know, that means that, you know, the rest of the, the song could be interpreted as non-pony if you read the lyrics. And it's like, well, that's kind of how most of it was anyway. A lot of the early stuff was really just up either about the show or from the show. It was a connecting point. It was something to write about. In fact, a lot of the early musicians were not just quote-unquote brony musicians under this definition. They made pony music in addition to other things. So it's a dumb, dumb term by people who willingly deprive themselves of beautiful things in life because it's not about something they're comfortable with. Those poor, poor children. It's, it's funny because um, when you look back at a lot of the early fandom music, a lot of it is simply electronic music without lyrics at all. Right. 
the other ridiculous thing is that completely negates the purpose of a tone poem. Come again? Yeah, how so? Just saying that it can't be pony because there's no words. A tone poem is just when you're trying to convey a mental imagery based off of music alone. They were very popular. Definitely during the Renaissance era, a lot of like Shakespeare plays were converted into tone poems and stuff. Oh, that actually makes a lot of sense. That is true, yeah. I don't know. There's this, There's this, There are some toxic mindsets present in the music production and music fan communities at the moment. And it's like, there's there's so much that could be done if we just didn't think that way. This reminds me of something, actually. I have heard that in the electronic side of the Brony music scene, there's a lot of, I don't know if I, sh- I should go as far as saying hatred, but there's a lot of like discontent between the electronic artists, and there's a lot of arguing and bickering, and obviously this fandom's had a bunch of drama and a bunch of different aspects, but um, how much has, has uh, this sort of fandom drama affected you and your music at all? To be honest, I tend not to operate in such a way where I'm affected by a lot of it. I kind of lone wolf a lot. It's why there aren't a lot of collabs that, you know, that I've been involved with. A few, but not many. I will say that I have observed some, quite a bit of bitterness. I think a lot of it has to do with the old names keep getting hounded for, you know, oh, we like the pony stuff you made. Yeah, but it is. Oh, we like the pony stuff you made. Why don't you make more? You should make more. And it's like they're being held to a standard that they never wanted to be part of. Meanwhile, the new artists aren't even getting the time of day because why go with something new and interesting and exciting when the old names are either producing material, new material still, or have produced the stuff that people are comfortable with. So the new names have to either conform to a standard that the old names never bothered to set. Meanwhile, they keep seeing the old names getting things like interviews like this one or show appearances with the illusion that these are you know, rewards instead of, you know, work. I mean, they, they can be fun and enjoyable, but they are also a task, their job. And they see it as, you know, I'm working so hard and doing all this stuff. And that's true. And they're not, they may not even be doing music in the scene anymore, but they're getting rewarded for that. Why is that the case? So this guy just tosses a couple loops together and he's all popular because he got in early. Gosh, story of my fandom career. <laughs> <laughs> But th- there's there's a sense of bitterness that I detect, and I may be off here because, you know, I'm one, not as active as I have been in recent months, and two, I kind of benefit from being one of those, one such first kind of people. But honestly, it boils down to the new names being held to a, to a very severe and increasing standard that the old ones never bothered to set in the first place by listeners who, frankly... They've helped. I mean, uh, this is hashtag not all listeners, but, you know, th- there's there's a standard that permeates the scene that is making things toxic for just everyone. It's funny that you mentioned that because that for me, my experience or my opinion or my observation, I guess, this seems a lot like the atmosphere that was around in sort of late season two, early season three type of thing where everybody had this sort of bitterness. And I don't know if it's just me moving away from paying attention to any of that, that I just don't see that anymore. Or the fact that our show, uh, us as a group, we're trying to actively put forth new musicians just as much as as we like to talk to older musicians. It's basically like a mix. Yeah, like that's been one of the most important things about this show for us is that we're not out here to do a music show to say, hey, we want to interview every famous person there ever was in this fandom and, and be, you know, friends with them and hang out with them and blah, 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 blah. And we don't care about any of the new people. Right. Finding the new people, like we we just recently did an interview with Luna Jax, who has 500 subscribers, but is making such a splash. Fantastic. No, and that was an incredible interview. That was really good. Yeah. Yeah. He is amazing. Like his honesty with his passion of music is just incredible. When you talk to him, it's like, is he for real? Is this guy still, is there people like this still out there? Like it's, he's amazing. That's fantastic. Yeah, he he brought Forrest in tears. Yes, I, I was in tears. I was in tears. I, I started getting teary during the interview, and then after the interview, I burst into tears. But oh. <laughs> it's funny that Snowblitz, you bring that up, because kind of bringing things back to Eurobeat, one of the things that was said about Eurobeat, which I have never forgotten, is Mike the Microphone once said that, quote, Travis is the most perfect man in the world. <laughs> I'm sorry, what? 
Basically, what he was saying is that you are like the ideal person in that you're just so gracious towards people and so kind and so interesting and you do so many things and you you know produce music wonderfully but you you have all these other aspects of yourself that are incorporated in in just like the most awesome way so how do you respond to that <laughs> wow that's it made him speechless i'm gonna need a minute i'm a little red here um <laughs> i mean i i'm i'm, I'm glad that people think that, i mean yeah, glad that people like the music but 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 like the way that I behave shouldn't be a surprise. Uh, one thing that I, I guess one thing that I've tried to never let happen is any sort of purported fame, letting any purported fame in the scene get in the way. Like this is this is something I did for fun. This is music about cartoon horses. I mean, fun music about cartoon horses. Some of it fantastic, but I I just I've never really had an excuse to be anything else than just sort of what I think is the right thing to do. I don't know there's stuff that I do wish that I could do more of or be better at. Um, but I'm I, I'm glad that people think that highly of me. Like, wow. Um, I wait. When did when did Mike say this? Um, I I actually it, this is a while ago. It wasn't too long ago, I didn't think. It might have been after BronyCon 2012. It was a while ago, but um, yeah, no, like I, I just, uh, I remember Cyril talking about it because Cyril was, uh, was laughing at it and, and just saying that, you know, as, as funny as it sounds, it's, it's kind of true. Like people that meet you always find you to be like this, uh, th this really gracious dude that's just really down to earth and, and, you know, a good person, essentially. I can speak for that just from somebody talking with you, um, uh, both on the business end and just personally. Well, everybody that I've heard talk about you that actually has an opinion says, oh yeah, Travis, he's the nicest guy. Like everybody, literally. Yeah, even when we were talking with you business-wise and everything, I've never had a bad experience about you. I've never heard anything bad about you personally either. And now I'm right again. Even talking to you right now, like I can tell you're a really nice person. I know it's nothing, but like I can just feel it for some reason. Snowblitz is feeling it. Guys, we're making the guest blush. Yes, you are. <laughs> Moving on! Thank you. <laughs> so, speaking of touching moments, you were at BronyCon 2014 performing, and I heard about a little something where somebody from the show came backstage and talked with you. What was it like meeting Daniel Ingram and hearing the things he said to you? Now, I've, I've bumped into Daniel a couple of times. That was not the first, but I don't think, I think that is what, maybe the th third grand total. Like, I think the first time that we, you know, hung out was actually the very first ever Free Northwest. But for him to say that, um, when, I, when I got off stage at BronyCon, I was ready to just kind of slump into a corner and just kind of let my tiredness take over. That and my immense sweatiness, so I could basically just splat on the floor. But I noticed this new person, you know, sort of there on the way down. And someone, I think someone had to actually tell me that it was Daniel Ingram. And the words that he said were, um, I'm, I'm, a f I'm one of your biggest fans. Aww. Um, I'm not sure if those were the exact words, but he's basically like, I'm a big fan. And like, took a picture together to, to sort of commemorate. He popped down for a bit. And I don't know, just the fact that uh, he could he could have picked anyone. We had so many amazing acts that night. Just people that came back, people that you know would have otherwise proclaimed to never be involved. You know, coming back to play for this set, and he sticks with me, and uh, I'm I'm incredibly touched. Just like I there's I, I it's hard for me to process really like how much that means to me. Yeah, like for the the fact that the guy that made the music for this show makes the music for this show so cool actually just gives a rip about some pasty white kid in california doing remix doing <laughs> doing oons remixes like not even not even innovative oons remixes stuff that's in a genre that died a few years ago in its uh country of origin but like i don't know it, it's 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 something i still look back on and i'm not sure if i can kind of really take it all in but i'm still incredibly appreciative I guess you could say Daniel Ingram was going a little batty for you, which, I mean, his I'm sure his appreciation definitely did mean a lot to you. So, I guess that I might as well move into our first song, Break Batty. You're listening to Elements of Harmony on Everfree Network.
That was Batty by Eurobibroni. Now, to talk about it from the beginning of it, uh, I want to talk about the vocals about it. I know you tweak your vocals a little bit with the auto tune. Do you do and have you ever done any singing lessons with uh, your vocals? Uh, I have on and off. It was mostly uh, formal training, and I forget it the instant I stop taking it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I try not to add too much. In terms of auto tune, I do admit to pitch correction, but I don't do. Uh, I don't know. I think I've only used the kind where it's literally like a drag and drop thing once for my own vocals, and that was on a particularly very like very very bad day with a deadline. With that, I have taken lessons, but it was all for like. This I love it. That's not how it actually sounds. Opera lessons, <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was for that kind of thing. It wasn't for pop singing, which. Eurobeat traditionally is. I don't know. I, I put it on there because I hate how I sound without it. Um, I'm a big perfectionist, and in some cases, um, like if I can hear someone is trying to be on and they're not, and it doesn't work with that particular style, it can actually cause me physical pain. 
And to put it another way, I've caused myself a lot of physical pain in that sense. So um, I don't know. Uh, I have a very high standard for how I sound. And I don't know. I wish that I could be more accurate more often, but that would mean practice. That would mean time. That would mean things that I sadly don't have. It's strange that you mentioned that because going back to some of the live performances that you've done, people were commenting on how well you hit the notes. Specifically, uh, you, I think, uh, I forget which one it was, but you were uh, performing um, Discord live on stage with Tomb, and um, somebody was saying that, you know, it sounds exactly like it does on the recording. Part of that is also to do with the fact that I've tended to sing over Tomb's recording, but, uh, I mean, if they're hearing me over it, then that's, I suppose that's a good sign. The other interesting thing is, like, Tomb boosted the key, and I have enough trouble singing Discord in the original key, but for some reason, whenever I'm doing Tomb's version, it seems to go by much easier. Huh. Oddly enough, I have heard that review. I'm not sure if it's the exact same one, but like I've heard people say as much. I don't know. I just I, I go back and listen to myself, and it's like, oh, and there's the there's the there's the cringing. There, it's happening. <laughs> I I don't know. I just can't stand to listen to myself. Well, it's not a bad thing if you judge yourself mostly. Like it means that you can improve. Like you have the ability to improve. For me, I sing and I judge myself frequently. Basically, if you judge yourself a lot, you know what to improve what you need to do with your singing voice or your voice is being critical of yourself is very important to progressing as a musician i think is what he's saying yes yeah and i've i've, I've always been open to it like it, i've uh, one thing that i've tried to do is never be um repelled or repellent of um advice even you know i've had some bad advice you know it's to stop singing you should never do it again but like some of the stuff that's like <laughs> Sell your computer. <laughs> that doesn't count. <laughs> it's like, no, but stuff, stuff is like, no, no, the vocals here aren't that good. You sound like you're straining. You need to sit properly and, and try it again. Like, that's actually probably solid advice. I mean, it, just because so, it's good advice doesn't mean I have to take it. Yeah. But just because someone doesn't like it doesn't mean that their opinion is to be written off either. Yeah, we should actually touch on that. Yeah. Constructive criticism is criticism, but that it's also followed up, or followed up with something that you can do to try to fix it. It's not just saying, you suck. It's saying, this sucks. Here's why. Here's how you do it better. For the most part. I mean... To be fair, I've, some of the best criticism I've received has been from people that were both unable to pinpoint exactly what the problem was, maybe may more where it was, and were like, you know, uh, it wasn't necessarily, oh, this is bad, or that they didn't know, or that they knew how to fix it. It was like, this area is a little bit weird, you know, maybe, maybe just, uh, just give it another go, give it another listen. And I did, and it did sound weird, and I was able to fix it. Turns out it was just a mic thing, or, you know, just a mixing thing. And I brought it back to them, and they're like, yeah, this is, this is much better, this is good. With how much of a perfectionist you are with your voice, how does that feel when you're going into a live performance? Like, do you get a lot of stage fright, and how do you overcome that? Terror. I honestly, it really depends on the show. It depends on just a lot of factors. I mean, obviously, there have been some times where, you know, my interpreted lack of, you know, lack of performance on a particular day was called out. But um, that's a that's a darker period I prefer not to go into. But like, uh, in terms of just general performance, like, okay, you know what, you know, I've done this before, to some extent, you know, there, there's a there's sort of a notion of performance where it's like, the people who are there and enjoying themselves will usually not notice unless it's grievous. Mm -hmm. And if it is grievous, then one thing that I've particularly appreciated about the MLP listening scene is that they're very forgiving, especially in live contexts. Yeah. I've had shows where my mix literally just kind of went out, where I could not get it back into the flow, back into rhythm, and I, ha I basically had to restart a song, which is not good mixing. But people were supportive, they applauded, and they apparently still enjoyed themselves. So to some extent, I sort of get over it with, you know, I've done this before. Some of the songs are dropped in pitch when I perform them live. Some stuff I just really can't do like I do in the studio. But, you know, I'm there to entertain first. You know, accuracy is um, not my utmost priority. It's there, but it's, uh, you know, if people are having a good time and it was a slipshod performance, I mean, obviously I'd like to work on the slipshod performance, but that means that I've done my job well. Would you say uh, or, or describe yourself as shy? It depends on the context. I would say introverted. 
I can talk to people if I feel like I have something to share, if I have something worthwhile. With certain groups, if I don't feel like I'm on top of things, then I'll tend to stay away. I can relate to that. So preparation would be a big key for you then with uh, these conventions then? Very, very much, yes. One thing that I constantly kick myself for is I never take enough time to actually practice beforehand. So, you know, the first couple of days before my set, you know, I'm going crazy. I'm, I'm going over tractor. I'm plugging stuff in. I'm tapping stuff. I actually, on the way to uh, Everfree Northwest this year, I had uh, my Cuneo, my instrument, uh, one of the controllers I use, on the, uh, on the tray. And I was tapping away at it. And the person in the seat in front of me just looks around like, that. you know, it looks like, what the hell are you doing? Yeah. And the rest of the trip was quiet. <laughs> <laughs> like, I'll, I'll try to fit it in, but uh, I don't know. I, I, I never practice as much as I like, but it really is crucial. For me, practice is pretty important to me. I'll, um, sorry, I'm going on and on about this, but like, I'll actually change my controller setup every few shows to, you know, make things easier, to make it easier to do an actually decent mix. And with the kind of show that I do, it's a little tricky to get it right, because as fun as it would be to just do the controller part, part of what made some of my very first shows uh, such a big deal, the thing that people seem to like, is that I actually sang at them, which means I can't party like a lot of the other electronic performers do before their sets. <laughs> I really would like to be able to party like they do, and the one time I did, terrible things happened. So <laughs> it's like, mm. <laughs> but I, I don't know, practice is more important than even I seem to acknowledge. Practice makes perfect. Going back to the live performance, so you were dragged on stage during Tomb set and other people's just seeing just how does that feel to just suddenly be thrown on stage and be like, hey, sing this with me. Remember the part when I was describing just sort of how I felt about before my own sets? Yeah. Yeah. That too. Okay. <laughs> well, the thing with Tombs is now Tombs and to some extent Alex has set when those happened. Um I know it's 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 interesting because people are like, oh, it's you, it's your song. You're you should go on up there. They're not drunk at the time. I just make them sound weird. <laughs> <laughs> well, I am. So it's like, OK, do do the thing. And when you're pushed, when you're actively pushed on stage, like the very first time that this happened, it's like, oh, OK, you know, I'm up on stage now and people are people are there and there's a mic. OK, this is this is going to happen. I haven't practiced. God help me. <laughs> <laughs> And I suppose it's all right. There's things about it that are a little iffy. Um, I remember for a little while, towards the very beginning, I actually wouldn't do Tomb's version of Discord live. It just didn't feel right. In fact, I remember early on, like some of the complaints after the very first BronyCon were like, why didn't you do your version? I was like, I wasn't a slated performer at BronyCon 2012. I, I made the decision to attend that week. So the fact that I even was up on stage at all is a pretty big deal. Is it because of the stutters? Is that what throws you off? No, actually, uh, those aren't really a problem. I'll just, I just tend to sing them kind of as they are. Like, I just sing over them and let the stutters do the stutters. For me, it's more the fact that it's faster, which means it's harder to pronounce everything clearly. Yeah. And it's higher, which means that I have to do strain and I have to do a bunch of stuff that's really not good for singing or good for your throat. But I don't know. It's, 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 it's interesting. People, there are a few good things about it, too. Like, in, uh, I'm referring mostly to uh, Tomb set. I mean, it, it hasn't happened many other times with other sets, but it's happened. It's nice to see people enjoying the song a little bit more with a live performer. I think, you know, it's one thing to hear the song that people know and love, but to hear it done sort of in a more live way with someone actually sort of actually performing it or both people actually kind of performing it. That seems to add something. That and it means that people recognize that Tombstone and I are not the same person. Yeah, that is true. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that that was a big thing. I remember you on Philly Radio talking about that and people coming up to you and saying that they really liked your remix of Tombstone's song or something like that. That still happens. And to be fair, uh, this is something, I, gosh, I practically have this down to a rehearsed statement. Tomb has been one of the best sports about saying this is a remix. I did a remix. Eurobeat did the original. Here's where to get the original. And I think people just assume that because it is more popular, it is the original. Also see Porter Robinson's uh, Unison versus uh, Knife Party's Unison. It's that kind of syndrome. It's no matter what the original artist actually does, they're not going to be able to shake that stigma. So. 
basically you're saying that you are the Robert Johnson of the Pony fandom. Because everything that Robert Johnson's done. I am the Banga to Tombstone Skrillex. All right. To throw a weird dubstep reference in there. It's the YouTube comments or YouTube description doesn't get read. No, it's 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 a YouTube title, uh, annotation, uh, description, interview, profile. It's it's people not reading. It's literally just people not reading at all. <laughs> it's people not reading. Well, yeah, that's true. <laughs> yeah, people go and comment. What's the name of this song? How do I spell FBI? Yeah, it's in the title of the video. You had to literally type in the title of the video to get to this video. I was in a singing group once and somebody said, yeah, it's like the intro to Elton John's Pinball Wizard. I'm like, don't you mean the who? <laughs> what? <laughs> oh my god. Who said that and can I kill them? I want to kill them too. Go ahead. I mean, the answer is yes, but where? Don't worry about it. It was at a church, don't murder them. While we have this brought up, can you talk a little bit about Discord and the success of it and the, the subsequent remixing of it? Uh, yeah, like, wait, Discord was late 2011, wasn't it? Boy, I'm forgetting some of my own history. I know it was one of the first ones that I listened to, but I didn't join till about February 2012. I think it was in Pony Beat Volume 1, yeah. Uh, Discord was Volume 2. Uh, Luna was one of the last ones I produced for Volume 1, because I remember, um... Ah, uh, right. I remember a lot of it was after the transition from, uh, Tan Man's, or Band Puff's profile to my own, and it just seemed like, okay, you know, I did a, I did a villain song for uh luna and people seem to like that and it had original vocals so you know uh, uh, uh this, this this villain concept seems really interesting let's let's take a look at this discord character he seems really cool and i did a couple of sketches the version that most people know is certainly not the first nor is it the one that i originally thought it would would be the song discord actually the uh musician i think jacob pritchett ended up fleshing out one of those ideas later on uh this year actually hmm. but you know, I was like, hey, you know, let's do this one. One of them was really orchestral. One of them was just kind of Eurobeat-y, um, or like it was inspired by uh, the Death Smile soundtrack. I have a weird thing for Bullet Hell Games. And uh, I was like, you know what? Neither of these are very Discord. You know, I could see Discord like changing genres midway through, or there was some other crazy stuff that I remember wanting to try. And oh, the fact that I bothered trying to do dubstep. Ooh. But like... <laughs> <laughs> And it was an experiment in something, you know, very different. Oh, there's a rock here. There's polka here. There's, you know, there's all this. The, the intro is Tocada and Fugue. And it just seemed like a fun idea. It's like, okay, you know, going to put out this remix and put it on YouTube. Blah! <laughs> and um, it just really took off. And um, I remember meeting Tombstone shortly around that time. I think this was when he was still a, uh, a pre-listener with Equestria Daily. A gig that I understand was short-lived in terms of Tombstone's decision like to stay on it. He just, I, I think, don't remember him liking it. But he was like, hey, you know, my sister really liked this song, and she showed it to me, and I realized, one, it was you, and two, it was really good. Do you happen to have the stems for that? I'm like, oh, yeah, sure. Um, You know, here's the here's vocals, and you need anything? No, no, I'm good. And then um, he streamed himself making it, and the next day he released it, and the rest is history. Just, uh, it, it, was, it was interesting to see it take off the way that it did. I do think that the simplified version that he kind of put together, it was a, a lot more graspable. There was stuff that I tried to do. Was, mine was a little bit, like, it, it tried to be too many different things, whereas Tombstones was immediately approachable. It had this, it was v painfully catchy. Like, try to remember, down, versus, dum, 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 dum. Dun, dun, it, it, he had he had a better song sense about it and it showed people showed it to other people they showed it to people who weren't fans of the show they the living tombstone was more than just you know some remixer he was this guy that made this incredibly catchy song and with the sort of increase of popularity and the eventual overtake people kind of applied the same assumptions to it that they do to other songs oh you know that you know there's an artist name and a song title clearly the artist is the same person that sings on it so Tombstone must be the guy that did the song. And Tomb was one of the first people to try to dispel this. But again, you know, it's a matter of not reading. Like at Bro yeah, at BronyCon 2012, he was asked about, you know, what about your song Discord? And he was like, I, di I did not make the original. I made the remix. Yerby Brony made the original. Him right there. That guy made the original right there. 
<laughs> that actually sounded really surprisingly good. Yeah, <laughs> that is. Yeah. <laughs> and he'll, he'll do that. And he does it from time to time. But like, he, he is adamant about it. And he gets asked about it all the time. And he's, in some cases, apologized for it. He's like, it, it, which he shouldn't have to do. It was a good remix of a song that I did. And the fact that a song that I was a part of got to the point where it is, I'm incredibly flattered. I mean, it'd be nice to have some of the recognition, but yeah. to be fair, that song does drive traffic to the original. Um, I get little notices for, you know, here's how much traffic which songs did this week. And, you know, it, it does help. And I'm not, I used to be a little bitter, to be honest. This is now that those years are kind of behind us, I can admit this. Um, I was a little bitter. It's like, come on, you know, he, he does this you know, poppy version and gets all this credit and fame. And, you know, I, I did the original so much art for so much art. <laughs> um, and, and, uh, but you know, at, at some point it's like, you know what, he did a, he did a better job with reaching people. And that to some extent, this, it was a smart move. If it makes you feel any better, I heard your music way before Tombstones. I mean, well, that's when I joined the fandom. Tomb was a summer 2011 musician, which is fine, which is where we get, it's where we get artists like Boshfire and like the microphone and a lot of the popular musicians that joined around that time. But it, it does tickle me a little bit when people are like, oh, you're the first stuff I heard. It's like, cool, cool. And I made sure, and I had insurance on that because I was the first that anyone heard. I just remember some friends of mine completely geeking out over the living tombstone. And I was like, who the hell is, what is a tombstone? <laughs> and they're like, the guy that wrote Discord. I'm like, don't you mean Odyssey, Eurobeat, Brony? <laughs> who's that guy? I, I guess you weren't called Odyssey back then, but yeah. I was like, who's that guy? Well, here's the thing. I, I was Odyssey before I was Eurobeat Brony. Actually, um, Eurobeat Brony came around when the word Brony was still new. And it literally, all it meant was fan of the show. Yeah. And, you know, um, someone actually, I don't think I even came up with a term first. It was after um, Evil Enchantress and Winter Wrap-Up was leaked. And one of the first comments, I remember this, was an image of Superman looking very giddy with his arms up. And the post was, is the Eurobeat Brony going to make a remix of this one too? <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, oh, that's interesting. And after a while, I started posing with the name Eurobeat Brony. And it just kind of stuck. All right, well, it is time to move into our second song break, and uh, since we've been talking so much about Discord, this is Luna by Odyssey Eurobeat. Deep. You're listening to Elements of Harmony on Everfree Network.
Oh, that brings me back. I have to say, just to start out, that this song is like the song that hooked me into Brony music because, I don't know, like during that whole time we were off, I was just singing to it because uh, I just love it so much. But uh, to go into the opening question for her song, what actually is Eurobeat, the genre? That's a good question. Eurobeat is the evolution of Italo Disco as uh, interpreted by Japanese listeners, basically. Long story short, as Italo Disco was dying in Italy, it was actually gaining some interest in Japan at about the same time as techno, yes, actually techno, <laughs> and other styles were getting popular. So it began getting a little bit faster, a little bit uh, rougher, faster and edgier, um, <laughs> like a lot of things in the 90s. <laughs> <laughs> but um, it did a lot of that, it added guitars, and the synths became more harsh. So it was uh, much bigger in the 90s and early 2000s in Japan, but all the producers, or most of the producers rather, are from Italy because they're sort of leftovers from the Italo, in Italo disco period. The style is categorized by beats per minute between 140 and 170, usually, you know, in a very rigid structure and uh, arrangement. Intro, riff, verse one, pre chorus, chorus, riff, verse two, pre chorus, chorus, guitar solo, or some solo of some sort. Riff, uh, verse three, pre-chorus, chorus, outro, or something to that extent. And the arrangement- And congratulations to Sliff for putting all of those on the screen. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> 3 <laughs> But yeah, that's Eurobeat. It's, uh, a lot of people know it from stuff like Speedy Cat, or, uh, Night of Fire, or, uh, Catch That Man, uh, LOL Internet. Uh, I hate to spout, I hate to, to you know, old school meme spout, but- that's where a lot of people actually have heard it from. If you've been, uh, I'm gonna gag a little bit beforehand. If you've been Rickrolled, technically that counts as Eurobeat by a Japanese standpoint. <clears throat> so a, lo a lot of people have heard it, but a lot of people, oh, it's it's DDR music. It's it's Initial D music. Well, in initial D music is a little more flattering because they actually license from the Super Eurobeat soundtrack or from the series. But that's Eurobeat. It's that very very silly, unashamed, 150 beats per minute synth brass kind of business gotcha yeah actually it's funny you mentioned speedy cat that's how i heard about it originally yep that is uh y and co the the guy that produced it and um i i sadly don't remember the name of the vocalist but um y and co is still active and gosh there's there's there are a few acts that are if they just got the exposure they needed uh that's that's a whole other thing i could go on for hours about what's uh, going on in the eurobeat world <laughs> <laughs> I was almost going to say, uh, you mentioned a minute ago that the Eurobeat genre seems to have died. That's correct. In Japan, basically the mainstream releases, well, the people that were in charge of sort of the mainstream releases started silencing independent releases for the most part, wouldn't allow them to be played in certain clubs, but they started also restricting the creativity of the labels producing it. Uh, you know, it must sound a certain way. It has to be, you know, a certain length. It, you know, make this one more aggressive. They didn't let it adapt to changes in music in general. And also, they only publish it in Japan. There are very few legal ways to attain Eurobeat in the United States, but and they're, they're, they exist, but they're not marketed because they don't have a marketing budget. Either that or they just don't care. Hmm. And yet, for all this, you know, they still insist on, uh, on releasing it. When it's been known that the Super Eurobeat series, which is not by any means the standalone Eurobeat series, it's hemorrhaging money. It costs them more to make than it earns them back in most cases. And it's stupid because, one, it would be a bad business decision to keep it as it is if it's doing that. And there are ways to fix it that they refuse to do. I'm saving a lot of time here and cutting some very wide corners, but even just simple things, I mean, simple, not necessarily easy, like international publishing, uh, non-exclusive publishing, like Monster Cat does, and just letting some producers try something new would be a big deal. And, you know, I say, you know, let them try something new, and I myself am the uh, epitome of not really deviating from a formula. But, <laughs> but, 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 but it's like the coaches, you know, it's like a coach in high school. You want people to do well, you know what it takes, doesn't mean that you can, that you're necessarily able to do it yourself yet you know it's 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 kind of to that extent mm -hmm. 
I see what needs to happen. And if I had time and money and a little more power than you, I would probably be in the process of doing that right now. So as a direct question to you, what made you want to focus on Eurobeat music? It's just the style that I liked. Before I knew what Eurobeat was, I was making very quick, fun, sort of video gamey music. Yeah. On like this little shareware, no, this abandoned wear MIDI sequencer. And it just sounded fun and exciting. And, and it had this raw musicianship behind the silliness. Now, granted, back then I couldn't understand what the vocalists were saying. So I thought, one, that they were, ja that they were all in Japanese. And two, that they were singing about deep subjects. In which case, neither proved to be true. <laughs> <laughs> but I noticed something fun about it. And yet, it had a strong sense of good composition. You know, uh, for something that you were supposed to jump around and dance to, it still had this chord structure or this riff that was just not heard in other styles. You don't hear these kinds of leads going on in other genres. Or th th people come close, but it's never the same. Uh, hard dance is probably the set of genres that comes closest. I mean, if you go on beatport, but really, the most of the hard dance I've listened to is, and I hate to be harsh, there are some people that probably do this well, it's wannabe Eurobeat. Mm. And that's right, I'm calling it out. Either Eurobeat needs to get into the hard dance category and start wrecking things, or the hard dance people need to step it up and start introducing some harsher brass, some more interesting lines. Boy, I could go on about this for ages. I can tell, <laughs> probably. Let's jump into a little bit more of the, the technical aspects of, of Eurobeat. Oh boy. So far as the instrumentation, what are some of the elements or the traditional elements that go into Eurobeat? Well, it's usually, um, I mean, in case some people can't parse it out, it's, it's a drum machine, there's a synth brass in the riff, there's an octave um, eighth note bass running throughout do, 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 do kind of thing um, with hi-hats on every other eighth, and eighth note. And th those are really just kind of the basics. That's, that's how you get the core. There might be some stabs along with the basses, the bass and the open hi-hat as well. But that's sort of the core of it. That and just some of the timing, uh, just sort of the uh, beats per minute, getting the arrangement right. It's usually a synth brass from, I'm tempted to say a JD-800, but as, as time has gone on, the technology has improved and some people are just, you know, learning to adapt layered sawtooth waves to get the job done, usually with some sort of envelope to give it a sort of brass-like sort of sort of a sort of that little attack there i was gonna ask when you start out writing a eurobeat song is there any particular part that you specifically start with not usually um in most well i say that in most cases i'll start with the brass riff because that's sort of the interesting part the fun part that's my hook in some cases i have started with a lyric or a vocal line first but I'll usually craft around the riff, like gone, you know, you know, it'll be around that. Uh, I, actually, I don't think I started that way with gone, but, you know, another song, um, Discord, I think, started that way. Very inspired by Dave Simon's Speedman. You know, I'll start with that and I'll sort of flesh it out. I'll give it some interesting layers. Uh, let's see what this does, what this does. And then I'll actually write around that, which is not always the best approach, but it gets the interesting production composition part down. So you do a lot of, let's say, parodies of the songs from the show. Specifically, when it comes to that stuff, do you work off of the melody of the songs first or the, the chord progression in the songs and just kind of work off of that? Or, or how, do you, how do you adapt to the songs? In most cases, I'll let the song inspire a new idea. You know, like, um, let's see, uh, was it You Gotta Share, You Gotta Care? Reminded me of another Eurobeat song that I've heard called uh, Oh Oh Cowboy which got censored because it used a uh, Toy Story sample in the beginning. Huh. But um, the, the riff was very, very fast and fascinating. And I wanted to, um, and the song was also very sort of Western flavored, you know, sort of cowboys and harmonicas and talking about whiskey in the intro. Don't ask. It was like that. And I'm like, you know, I want to do something like this for this song. And, you know, I'll, I'll craft an idea around it. And then the rest of the song, I'll try. I actually started being less... Uh, in the very beginning, I was less faithful to the original than I could be. But over time, you know, there are a few complaints like, I can't follow this. I can't understand this. And I started uh, including, uh, you know, either references to or basically lines from the original. And, you know, now I try to stay pretty faithful to the parts of the original that are, in fact, the original. But when it's my turn, you know, I'll, I'll let it go pretty crazy. Actually, there's an interesting thing that happened with this and um, the This Day Aria thing. What was happening was I forgot that there was the and I created, I wouldn't call it a drop so much as just sort of an unusual little take. Let me see if I still, I don't have it in my folder anymore. 
but you know it was uh it was very very chaotic and dark actually one of the darkest things i've done with synth brass in a long time but it didn't fit the original and i kind of evaluated between the two and it's like you know what people might actually be pretty upset with this i did end up releasing that part of the song later as just a little snippet on uh you know on tumblr but you know i'll tend to stay true to the original when the original's around You've um, played with instrumentation a little bit, too, from the, uh, the traditional instrumentation that you mentioned earlier, specifically with stuff like the organ at the beginning of Discord. And uh, the, actually, Discord's a perfect example because there's all sorts of interesting instruments that get incorporated into that song, um, as well as the, the metal section at the end of Luna. So how is it that you are able to get away with such blasphemy? Well, um, don't call metal blasphemy. <laughs> <laughs> metal probably wants to be called blasphemy though like that's the sort of thing it's thank you but like uh, honestly it's not that big of blasphemy it's not that it's something that is you know oh he dared do that in your week so much as just not done very often um i think it's a lot of you know avix will be like yeah we're not going to publish that but with songs like luna or uh like discord well discord the genre mixing was intentional because i don't think Discord would want to be constrained to such a genre, you know, a single exclusive genre. He would probably try to switch things out mid-song. Ooh, actually, that gave me a performance idea. Ooh. It, it's been done before. People have, they've done experiments with this. Um, there's a song called Right Now by Dark Angels that's basically Screamo Eurobeat. Well, it's more like 90s Linkin Parkish Screamo, but oddly enough, it executes it well enough, surprisingly. It's never been done again, and it's sad, but... There are examples of experimentation in Eurobeat. In fact, there are a number of uh, Eurobeat songs from a label called High Energy Attack. One used live brass, and another one used an accordion. And I find them fascinating. I mean, they've become a little bit depressed lately. They're not doing as well as they'd like. And that's sad. But, like, they've done a lot with it. And it's not impossible. It's just, the, you know, the question remains, when does it stop? You know, how far can you go without it not sounding like Eurobeat anymore? And that, I think, is where the problem lies. You know, if you do a simpler line with a non-brass instrument, is it, is it still Eurobeat or is it just really fast trance? If you slow it down but keep the arrangement, is it just really updated Italo disco? It's a genre defined by its rigidity, which is both its blessing and its curse. Actually, I do have some backstory on the, screen, on the uh, metal part of Luna, if people are interested in it. Yeah. yeah. This dates back to the uh, Cupcakes remix, That Far Back. Wow. Oh, dear. Wow. Which was like the third or fourth song I made. Now, <clears throat> the reason for this is I was there when Cupcakes, the fic, was being posted post by post. <laughs> <laughs> and it was still fairly scandalous at the time. And I wish I hadn't read it, but I did. Yeah... And all the alternate scene, and alternate endings and cutscenes that were actually part of it. Yes, there were such things, and my voice is starting to go. <clears throat> yes, I remember these. And so, uh, you know, I, I wanted to do Screamo actually in that. I wanted to do something that was just legit frightening. I chickened out. Oh. But I was like, you know, I, I want to do this. This seems like an interesting thing to fit into a song about Technicolor horses. And... People thought that, you know, that I was done with, you know, the Super Pony Beat Volume 1 thing. Oh, he did at the gala. He did all of the songs. Yay. And an original tune with vocals was very much out of the picture at the time. And I thought about it. Mind you, um, a lot of the early fandom music was posted to the uh, comics and cartoons board of 4chan. And at the time, I was still pissed scared of 4chan. If the song did not do well... You know, my fear was, oh, they're gonna, you know, they're gonna think it's terrible. They're gonna do all this stuff, which is utter garbage because they were actually unusually supportive in the early days. Back in the day, I actually used to go there with the early drafts. I'm like, what, you know, let me know what you think. People, people would tear into it, but then when they came back with improvements, they're like, no, 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 you know, you actually, you actually did fix that. That actually sounds a little better. In fact, uh, that was the case with Diamond Dogs. The original, uh, when I posted the vocals, they're like, are you serious? These are terrible. Rewrite these, like now. And I started rewriting it, and then uh, I remember seeing a post that was, it wasn't like this, but it's like, so, uh, listen, um, you know, the, the, you know how we told you to rewrite that? We, we're, it's kind of growing on us. Can you, uh, can you keep that? <laughs> but for bringing it back to Luna, I was scared to death of releasing the song because not, it had vocals, and it was this dark brooding song about a very happy show. 
it just seemed like an interesting concept. Uh, the idea of things wanting to cause harm in a very almost saccharine happy land. But nevertheless, I'm like, uh, this is happening. I'm going to do it. Mm -hmm. And it's out there. And OK, going back with that, I thought about the idea of just releasing the version with uh, death metal vocals at the end. Because, you know, the idea of turning into Nightmare Moon, etc., or you know, turning into a third party sort of version of it. And it's like, nah, you know what? That's a little bit much. Let's let's keep it all Eurobeat. Ah, but I like this. Don't compromise your artistic vision here, man. Artistic vision. Bernie music. Pick one. Um, <laughs> 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 but like, it was like, well, wait, wait, wait. What do I do here? Uh, so I released both versions, you know, nightmare mode and dream mode. And it was like, you know, if you don't like death metal vocals, then you got the dream mode. But if you're willing to sort of get the full story with the, you know, with the notion of corruption, you know, the, the person kind of being overtaken, then that's nightmare mode. And nightmare mode was sort of the official version for me. And it's one of the reasons that I tend to perform that version instead of dream mode. Interesting. Yeah. So, um, I don't know. I, I kind of always wanted to do screamo in a pony beat tune just to kind of throw people off and be like, whoa, that's kind of weird. But never really got the chance to until Luna. And that way it didn't feel like I was tainting the original song. Oh, people make the show not for kids. <laughs> and it, it, to be fair, it would have been a little rough. I did want most of my music to be approachable. Accessible, yeah. I say this in the face of having written Worldly Spirits. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, Eurobeat, uh, for people who may want to, you know, maybe get into that Eurobeat genre or just kind of do kind of similar electronic music as you do, what kind of tips, tricks, hints, any th insight you can give to people who may be starting out? Make good music first. Worry about the genre later. Um, a good melody or a good hook will serve you ten times better than the shiniest, most polished bass growl or, you know, lead synth in most cases. Even Big Room House has to have some sort of a hook. As much as I find you know, I have some objections to the genre, it still has some sort of creative merit. Write something good first, then learn the tools of your trade. Learn how to compose, learn about layers, learn about EQ, learn about mixing, learn about mastering. Learn what it takes to do what you want to make. Don't do what I did. Don't let yourself learn only one style ever. Learn styles, like learn genres. The more that we know, you know, the more people pick up genres that might have fallen by the wayside or have lost popularity, the better, the more we can gain from them. But you know, just just make music first. If it needs to be electronic power to you, like if that's how, what you want to make, but worry about making a good song first. Also, if you're doing music as a business, get over the idea of, oh, my music should never be for sale. I, I should be handed things because I make the music. I earned it. You got to do things for yourself and it's worth asking for something in return. If it is original work, if you put effort into something, it's okay to be like, look, if you want to have this audio experience on demand, I need an expression. I need a token or something. A lot of people are like, oh, he's charging for music. Or, With pony music, yeah, it's a little, uh, if he gets why I don't require people to pay. But if you made an original and you need to eat, charge for it. I, I'm going to be that guy. Just charge for it. Do it. Support yourself. I full heartedly agree with that. Yeah. Yeah, I agree with that too. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because artists, a lot of the time, like, I went to an arts high school and I know a lot of artists, and, like, my artist friends that I know still live with multiple people in crappy little houses in the middle of the city, trying to scrape by with doing music lessons and, uh, you know, trying to get their band out there and stuff like that. So, you know, asking for some kind of compensation for stuff that you have created is how an artist gets by. Right, and to some extent to suggest that, you know, music should not be charged for is to suggest that the work that goes into creating music is without merit. It's part of why, oh, just a musician. No, no, we're not just putting creative work into this, we're putting objective work into this. We're listening, you know, we're making sure that the, that the high end isn't shrill, that the, that the mids aren't muddy. We're creating an audio experience that is ultimately pleasant or at least expresses what we need to do and that takes time that takes work and experience exactly you know it's a it's the whole oh, why should i pay you for this it took you 10 minutes because i took 10 years to learn how to do this in 10 minutes and not to mention too like if you're like for people if they're stealing music like taking it free or pirating it what you're doing is you're causing them very horrible pain for that for example 
You're not paying them for fame. You're paying them so they don't sleep in, in their car. Yeah, yeah, pretty much. Essentially. Especially for people who are more independent artists. People who are independent and don't, can't, aren't like on any kind of continuing revenue. Record label. It's a lot harder. Yeah. So the moral of the story is to go out and support your local artist on uh, Bandcamp or through their <laughs> PayPal donation link. Or, or their Patreon. Or their Patreon, yeah. iTunes. Throw pennies at them. Now, granted, you know, a lot of people are like, oh, you know, I want to hear what I'm getting first before I get it. You know, some people really are able to see the physical product before they get it, or something to that extent. There is merit to that. And that's why I like Bandcamp. You can listen to something all the way through before you buy it. But a lot of people are like, oh, you know, it's music, it's audio, it shouldn't be you for sale. It's, you know, it's it means that when that happens, and boy, this is a whole other can of worms, but... It means that the artist sees nothing, they see no return on investment for what they paid to get the job done, time or money, and that means that they can't make more, or uh, unless this is literally just a hobby for them. I've seen a few people in the Eurobeat scene that are like, oh, you know, I run a label and all our releases are for free, and, you know, this person, I, I just start, I just finished telling them that they should be happy that I pirated their album because now people get to hear it. It's, no, you just deprive them of their source of income. They're going to have to fire artists. They're going to have to sell equipment because of you. I mean, not literally, but, you know, enough of it, and that happens. Yeah. There's problems on both sides, and I'm, I, I want to reach a compromise. But in the end, if you like something that someone made and you listen to it, it's worth owning it. It's worth supporting that. There is, I believe, and here I go making an ethical assertion, but it's, frankly, the right thing to do. It's like... You're owning an audio experience, whether it's a file or a CD or whatever the medium is, you're owning what happens between your ears in the same way you would a gumball or a painting. You know, you're, you're owning an, a visual experience. Mm -hmm. So you are essentially taking something without giving what is due for it in return. You know, a lot of people, oh, it's an MP3. You shouldn't have to pay for a crappy MP3. You're paying for an audio experience. Yeah, but it's everything. Yeah, but did, is it the song? Not really, but is it the song? Yeah, you should pay for it. And watch, there's going to be a huge crash storm for this on every channel for me. You want to sell? Bleh, whatever. It's been a while since I've been in... It's been a while since i faced the storm. Yeah. Well, unfortunately, we are out of time tonight. This has been a great discussion. As always, it has been a pleasure talking with you, Odyssey. Thank you so much for coming out on our show tonight. No problem. Thank you so much for having me. And for all you listeners, don't forget to tune in for the other great programming that you can find here on Everfree Network. On Wednesdays, we have Into the Spotlight with Asaka Jack at 8 p.m. Thursday, Sketchy Sounds Live Songcast at 4 p.m. And then Equestria Unlimited at 7 p.m. And on Friday, you can hear the Lunar Republic Takeover at 4 p.m. All these times are in Central. Until next time, this has been... Snowblitz. Six String. Zeta Prime. Four Strain. And Starlight Ironhoof. Good night and good buck. Support new musicians.